Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for uh, another one of our uh, conversations about uh, youth in Canada. Today, we are going to be talking uh, about mental health and digital well being. And um, I'm joined today with uh, Emmanuel Perron. Welcome, Emmanuel. Um, hey. Just very quickly, th thank you for joining us. Um, we're going to get you to introduce the CL and yourself very shortly. But just for those of you who don't know, uh, my name is Dave Schultz. I'm a, uh, a partner at Leger and an executive vice president of the Toronto office, uh, doing mostly work in uh, communications and public relations research. Uh, but today we are talking about uh, youth. And this comes from a study. This is our third year doing this study. We talked to about 3,000 uh, millennials and Gen Z. And the study has a number of uh, categories that we run through. Today, we're talking about mental health. In a week from now, we're talking about influencers. So who do these, this audience look to when it comes to uh, influencers and what's important to them? Um, but we're the, uh, you know, we bring the research together and then we want to bring experts in as well, which is why uh, Emmanuel is here with us today. Uh, so very quickly, Emmanuel, if you can just tell us a little bit about yourself and Luciel and uh, and your role uh, today. Yeah, thank you, David. So I'm Emmanuel, obviously, <laughs> as you can see with my name under the screen. So I'm teaching and also uh, doing a PhD at UDM, uh, Université de Montréal, and I'm also the co-founder co of Le Ciel. So what is Le Ciel? Well, it stands for Centre pour l'intelligence émotionnelle en ligne. Uh, so the Center for Emotional Intelligence Online. And that's a foundation that raises awareness uh, of mental health issues related to social medias. So we operate mainly on two levels. The first one is prevention. So in school, secondary schools, we are, we are doing a workshop called the um, self-defense workshop related to digital life and digital environment. And one thing that is so very important for us in these workshops is to create a conversation with students and really to hear what they have to say about their own experience with their uh, digital environment. Though, so that is our main focus to help uh, and promote well-being uh, with youth. Secondly, we are raising awareness with uh, content on our digital platforms, such as Instagram, and with a podcast where we are uh, discussing issues with experts uh, of digital well-being. Perfect. Thank you very much. So we're going to run through a little bit of the study results and, uh, and have a little conversation today about what this means uh, for the youth of Canada, what it means for uh, the rest of Canada, and what it means for people who are working and addressing this audience on a regular basis. Um, a couple of quick housekeeping notes. We are recording this. Uh, you will receive a copy. Um, I believe by the end of the day, you'll have a copy, uh, a link sent to you. Uh, as well, you will receive a copy of the full report less the financial data. So we have a separate section of the report that just deals with uh, millennials, Gen Z, and financial aspects. So how are they saving? Are they saving? Where are they spending their money? Fears, concerns uh, towards the future when it comes to money. That is a separate paid report if anyone wants that. But what we're going to be talking about today, you will receive a copy of the report. By the end of the month, we're hoping, so close to that. Uh, but everyone who attended today will get a link to that as well. As we run through, obviously, uh, Manuel and I will be uh, will be talking, but we're open to questions as well. There's a little panel on the right-hand side of your screen. Feel free to throw in questions in there, and uh, we'll address that uh, uh, as, the, as the session goes on, but mostly at the end of it. So feel free to ask questions anytime as we're going through. So let's start talking uh, about some generational observations. And Emmanuel, you were talking about this when we met the other day, and I found it really interesting that um, it, it doesn't so much matter someone's uh, you know, region, employment status, or income, but age is becoming the main differentiating factor. Can you talk to that? 
Yeah, totally. Uh, what we can see is that the age is very important to uh, have your own unicity and to relate to other people. We can see this with uh, medias, like uh, one person uh, that is, I don't know, 16 or 21 in Quebec will mostly identify with a YouTuber that is American or German or French, you know, in other countries because they have the same age, the same cultural references, then with their parents or with their co cousin that is 40, even if they are living like both in Toronto. So it's a, a the main differentiating factor. So yeah, so the, the age is really important. Okay, and, and, and I, find that, I find that really interesting. It's almost like there's, especially when you talk about uh, interacting with other countries, there are no borders when it comes to uh, people in these age groups as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and then we're also starting to see them shrinking. So if you, um, those of us who are uh, much, much older uh, will remember uh, the, the, the book that David Foote put out years ago about the boomers. And, um, you know, really you're looking at the, the number of years within each generation is becoming less and less. That being said, within those generations, they are certainly more fragmented. And I know, uh, Emmanuel, you've done some work in this area as well. Yeah, totally. And even if it's uh, university classes or with uh, students from the secondary school, uh, we are looking at issues and that are different uh, between certain people. You know, if they have interest in, uh, interests in uh, games or in social medias, or some are looking at YouTube streaming or Twitch, uh, seeing video games, sports, they, they respond very well when we are rec recognizing their unicity. The fact that they are all very different people with their own interests and they their own like line in life. Yeah, and I think that's an important point. I'm going to go back to this slide. Just say because we're talking about Generation Z does not mean Generation Z is a homogenous group. They are uh, within that there are clusters of, of groups that come together. There's some overarching. Uh, generalities, but in general, to Emmanuel's point, they are specific groups within there. So I, I think when you're looking as as a business that's looking to interact with these audiences, um, you, you're making a mistake if you're assuming one size fits all. Is is what I'm taking from this? Yeah. Um, and then also, it's a very uh, a diverse group compared to uh, where we've been in the past. Uh, so this is just a slide looking at uh, people who are uh, a visible minority. This is across all of Canada. Uh, obviously, I'm in Toronto, and these numbers are even higher in Toronto. But if you look at people aged 15 to 34 in 1996 in Canada, 13% were part of a mis visible minority. That number has doubled. Uh, same thing, it's more than doubled in terms of people identifying as LGBTQ plus within that. And then, you know, we've always talked about um, Canada is, is, a, is a multilingual company, country, it's a bilingual official country in terms of French and English, yet you look at the proportion of youth, 13 to 39, who, whose mother tongue is not French or English, that's currently at 15%. So beyond uh, the, the different generations, beyond the segments within those generations, we're also talking about a very diverse population, much more diverse than, uh, than over 20 years ago. Yeah, definitely, and I would say that even... Sorry, go ahead, Emmanuel, yeah. Yeah, and even with, uh, because we're talking about the digital environments, what we're seeing with these groups, um, LGBTQ+, plus and my, the visible minorities, is that the social medias are creating spaces when they can um, represent themselves if they, if they are not seeing uh, the representation that they want in the mainstream medias, for instance. No, I think that's an important point. We're going to come back at the end of this about what does all this mean? And I think that being represented within um, both from a, uh, you know, how do you appeal to this audience, but also how do you reduce uh, mental health stressors on this audience um, as part of it as well. So 
bit of a precursor as to where we're going with this today. But let's talk about mental health. Because that is that is what our uh, our, our advertised webinar was about. Uh, you know, basically, we're looking right now with uh, three, you know, especially during COVID-19, three crises happening at the same time. We have a public health crisis, an economic crisis, but then there's also the mental health crisis and uh, and and youth uh, in these in these two generations are certainly at the forefront of that. The um, just quickly, we asked in our survey, did COVID-19 have a negative meant a negative impact on your psychological health, uh, et cetera? And generally, we're seeing uh, millennials and Gen Z saying yes, there has been a negative impact and and I don't I don't think that's surprising results when you look at our our weekly covid survey that we've done nationally since April as, as Leger of all Canadians regardless of age uh 60% on average every week from the beginning to even now have a fear that they're going to get covid so there there's that there's that fear that I'm going to get sick and if that's always over us um, how we interact with youth in our population and how they interact with each other. It's no surprise that we've seen a, uh, a potential impact on, on negative, uh, potential negative impact on psychological health. And then we also asked in the past two weeks, have you felt tired? Have you felt depressed? And as you see the numbers on the screen, it's uh, anywhere from a quarter to almost half of, uh, uh, of the youth that are telling us that they that they're missing out on life, that they're more nervous than usual. So so a lot has been happening in the last little while related to COVID-19. And I'm sure Emmanuel, in your practice, you're seeing this over the last year as well. Yeah, especially the, this summer, we created like focus group with uh, young people to give them a voice and talk about their experience uh, during uh, you know with COVID-19. And there was two things that stand out that was more common uh, amongst uh, young people. The first one was with routine. If you don't have a job, if you don't go to school at summer, it's really hard to recreate this kind of routine you had, seeing your friends, uh, going to your sport, like us usual sports or things you're doing outside of school because everything was closed. So they they were having a hard time to adapting new activities, new daily routine, and they were working on that. So that's one common um, point. This the second one is feeling useless. You know, you're in a pandemic. You're seeing on the TV that it's very hard for everyone, and you're not going to prom, and it's making you feel sad. But you don't want to complain because. You know, it's prom and some people are really sick. So there's this issue of uh, not feeling that you're doing enough for your collectivity, you know? And, and it's not because you're 20, 21, 22, that you are at your apartment with a job. A lot of young people are still living with their parents. So there's this struggling like dynamic of what am I doing right now? Yeah, de definitely. That being said though, one of the things that we've found is that um, this sense that they are experiencing problems with their mental health hasn't really changed um, from year to year in our study. So even prior to COVID, uh, we find that 66% of Canadians in this, these age categories believe they have experienced problems with their mental health. So I think because it's such a fragile audience or fragile stakeholder group, uh, who are regularly experiencing uh, anxiety for a large part and to a, si a significant amount, 18% are experiencing uh, depression, something like COVID um, has the potential to impact even more. And I think we have to be very aware of that as uh, people who interact with these audiences when it comes to this time. Yeah. And then we're also seeing, if you talk about antidepressants, so this is... Uh, a scientific study looking at uh, Quebec youth, but if you look at it over time, and the uh, uh, it works from 2006 through to 2016 um, or 15, you see the increase in antidepressant taking among this audience. So it isn't just a case of it's being reported to us. We're always seeing an impact in terms of. Uh, 
uh, behavior in terms of people taking uh, antidepressants at the same time. Yeah, and this this is also a scientific study um, showing like the progression of teens saying that they meet their friends almost every day. So what we're seeing, uh, the hypothesis here is that since like the internet, you know, in the 90s, uh, we're seeing this time that meeting almost every day decreasing, right? And this decreasing is even more severe in 2010. And 2010 is associated with the meme culture, um, like nine gag, uh, like memes, uh, jokes, even by brands, um, the, uh, the, the smartphones as well. Uh, so it, it's something to see because seeing people face to face, and we know it very well right now because of uh, the, the COVID-19 is really, really important for mental health. So yeah. promoting these connection is really important. And I, I just want to add that when we're showing this graph in classes, the teens are raising their hands like, oh, I would meet my friends every day, but my parents prefer that I stay at home to discuss with them because it's more secure. You know, so there's limits to this, obviously. So, so they would be meeting if they could, more what you're saying, but yeah. they, they want to support what their parents, yeah. Um, so one, one of the comments that we've received, uh, so very quickly, just, just backing up, someone asked, how do we define the generations? And we talk about them being narrowed, and is it an arbitrary? Um, sure, there's some, there, there's a cynical view that we define generations shorter and shorter because we need to have a new media topic to discuss because we want to identify a new generation but a lot of times we find especially in this study we see a, a distinct difference uh, of, of a larger group and that larger group because there's the subgroups within and it's easier to have the subgroups we're finding it's narrowing and narrowing over time so yes it's an arbitrary here's the ages that we're going but it's based on some scientific evidence that allows us to define that group um, this this other question, it's it's a comment and a question, and Emmanuel, I think we should address it right now because I think it very much is what a lot of people are saying. My late teen daughters feel guilty for complaining or missing out on those fun things when so many are struggling with their physical health and our isolation. Media is giving them the indirect message that it is somehow selfish to feel that way, and they should be thinking more globally than personally. So, and this, the first writer of the question didn't, didn't say it, but what I'm taking out of that is there's a bit of a shaming. If I want to go out and be, have that FaceTime with my friends. And, I, and for those of you who are my age, we don't mean FaceTime on Facebook. We mean FaceTime in person where we're seeing each other. Um, for those of you who want to go out and, and do that, um, you're going to be shamed for it, or you're going to feel bad because the media is telling you not to. It, that also impacts on, on mental health. Yeah, and I would, yeah, totally. And um, no matter what is the struggle that you're facing, uh, even if you're a teenager, you have to have space to talk about it and to find support. But if you're going on Instagram, or I'm saying Facebook, but Gen Z is definitely not on Facebook, but. No, I know. That's why I keep on referencing us older population when I say that. Yeah, but um, if you're seeing a comment, it's it's not just the media, you're seeing a comment about someone that looks like the same age as your mother or father, a father and they're saying teens are complaining too much, you will read that and probably absorb that. And even if your parents are really open to listen to you, maybe it will uh, block you in some way. So that's why it's important to ask how are they doing and not judge because yeah we all have our our difficulties related to everything that's happening okay yeah perfect thank you and thank you for that question again if anyone wants to there's the question bar on the right hand side of the screen feel free to uh pop something in there uh, so so let's continue along so I, I find this facetime one uh very very interesting as well in terms of when people are interacting uh, the next thing that we wanted to talk about is that we are seeing different levels of uh, anxiety starting to come out across the age groups. 
So uh, if you are, you know, and in, in general, this is what we're seeing in terms of the overlap is that in your 13 to 19 year old, we're hearing that, uh, you know, life is not exciting enough. The 20 to 29 year olds are starting to tell us that it's life is starting to get fast. It's also not exciting enough. And maybe we're missing out on life right now. But then you see starting to come in some of the self doubt, some of the financial difficulties. And this is what our other report is going to focus on. And then in 30 to 39, it's about receiving recognition. And in general, this is the age that's that's experiencing this the most. And you're seeing this as well in your works, uh, Emmanuel? Yes, especially with um, the girls, actually. Um, or like the, the fact that your life is not exciting enough. Girls in classes, I mean, with the workshop, are mostly saying that they don't have the perfect body, the perfect, you know, uh, they don't travel and all this Instagram lifestyle. And with boys, we're we're seeing a lot of um, I can pay for this shoe, like for this product that I want, and that seems popular. So that's um, sources of anxieties of like if I don't have this that I'm seeing on screen, I will be uh, I will like be a victim of it, social exclusion. Like, okay, so but then we're stuck, right? And and you just we had a question on this as well. So they're they they recognize that social media, the world of social media, can be a cruel world, both from some you know specific uh, activities or or people could be targeted, but also to how do I compare myself to this world? So we have someone who's who's asked a question. Basically, they haven't allowed their 14 year old uh, to do access to this yet. But during COVID, would it help with her mental health? Because if she doesn't have the face to face time with her friends, should she be having it through social media? So how do you balance this where social media is a cruel world, but it also seems like it's a necessary world, especially during COVID? Do you have an answer for that? Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> like the question. Like what am I doing? I think the um, the approach that we're taking uh, with the uh, foundation is to have an open conversation. If your decision is to not let uh, your like your kid on social media explain why, explain why you're worrying about her uh, or him. If you do uh, accept that your children that your kid has a Instagram or something guide them because you can one one day they will go on instagram and see those models in like at the beach with this body you know so it's not a new problem uh, that we are just seeing one uh, type body type on in the media so you can address that because if even if they don't even if they follow like models or do not follow models it's the conversation with their parents that means the most. If you had a conversation about um, like your, your self-esteem and how you perceive yourself, it will um, really help uh, your, your relation with, with your kids um, on social media or not. But search, you have to guide them and be there and that they know that you can support them. That's, that's the, the thing either way. Yeah, and I also think there's an important distinction between uh, social media between friends and social media with the larger audience as well. So during COVID, part of this is, you know, part of the anxiety is I, I'm missing out. So if I'm, I, I think sometimes social media can make us feel like we're missing out on even more. But if I, if you as a parent are finding ways for your children to connect with other children using uh, any type of, you know, well, like a Zoom device or any type of social interaction device, that that relationship with their friend and network is still there. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be Instagram or TikTok or whatever it may be if you're still concerned about it. But I agree with you, Emmanuel, that conversation becomes really important over time. And I've just clicked on something I'm not supposed to, so give me a second. There we go. Okay. 
Um, so let's talk a little bit about the digital habits of, of this audience as well. Um, it really, what we're finding is that uh, we, we ask them to what degree does being online or being connected digitally impact uh, your relationship with your family, your romantic relationships. And we see that there is two sides to this, exactly what we've just been talking about. There's the, there's the impact of uh, our relationships can be enhanced through social media. Um, but in terms of our relationship with ourselves, the impact becomes much more negative. Um, and part of that, in, we ask, you know, overall positive, it allows you to uh, stay in contact with friends, stay in contact with family. 36% of the people we talked to said that social media has a, has a positive impact on their romantic relationships. Um, at the same time, it's like you're able to connect with people, uh, you know, a better connection with some people, to be more informed, to acquire new knowledge, and 59% say that it's making life easier. So, so I, I don't want to come on these types of talks and, and say, you know, doom and gloom, there's a negative aspect only. There are positive aspects to being digitally on. It's about being on digitally in a smart way. And, and I think, Emmanuel, what you were just talking about is making sure you have the conversations about the other side of it. Yeah, clearly it's not black or white. It's yeah. a little bit of both, yeah. Yeah, no, and, and clearly, just as any of us who have been parents of teens or millennials or uh, now Gen Z, uh, it's not going away. So it's a matter of how do we have this relationship with social media as uh, as, as parents of youth, uh, as as youth, uh, but also and also as businesses interacting with you. Uh, we need to make sure we understand this relationship very well. Yeah, uh, and on yeah. Go ahead. This is your, your, I you would say on the well. bright side, you know, on the bright side of social medias, why are um, you uh, young people using them? Well, especially when we're asked teens, the first motivation for using social media is uh, social connection, like because you're a teen, you're constricting your identity, your relational autonomy. Um, and you're in the comfort of your house, of your home. Meanwhile, you're testing things. Oh, if I post a photo, a story on Instagram with me and this new style, what what is the reaction of my um, network? So you don't have to take as, as much risks as if you were going to school with like this new outfit. So that's one example, but you can test your relation, your relationships, your friendships, et cetera, in DMs. Uh, DMs, I, I mean direct message, message. so a uh, high message uh, on Instagram to, um, yeah. A second motivation to use social media is to construct your identity. And uh, young people in class would say they explore the inter their interests in uh, by scrolling on Instagram. Uh, the CEO of Instagram said that uh, young people are the population that are most um, using the explore option on the platform. Like explore, you're looking at accounts that you're not following normally, but you're exploring new things. And my like favorite uh, way to explain identity with social media is by um, quoting this girl in a class um, that said, on social media, I have a voice. My parents are telling me what to do at home. My teachers are telling me what to do at school. And I, I don't feel like people are listening to me. And that resonates with when we are talking about COVID-19. Um, so when I'm posting something, I feel like I'm finally saying something and that people are listening. If they are or not, that's another thing, you know, um, mm -hmm. but they're, they have a feeling of having a voice. And the last part is uh, the culture. They are young people, uh, Gen Z and millennials differently, are really creating a culture um, on uh, social media on, in the digital environments. And this culture is rapidly evolving. 
like at this rapid pace. I am sure that you all have had knowledge it. And uh, you have to be humble. It's okay to not understand every practices and every trend on social media. It's, uh, it, it, I mean, it's okay. It's normal. <laughs> yeah, no, de definitely. Uh, it, it, is, it is normal. Um, that being said, the interactions are there, the motivations are there. There is a negative side to this as well. And, uh, you know, we're seeing that on, uh, or at least people of this age are identifying that they are seeing this, they, they have a lack, a less intention, attention span, uh, less ability to accomplish that tasks. There's an impact on their physical, psychological health, self-esteem. Um, and and they, they, they're they telling us that they know if they were to reduce their time on social media, their health would be better uh, and their mental health would be better. But they're they're dependent on it, so it's a it's a real challenge to uh, to, to work with the positive and negative at the the two sides of the coin on this one. And I and I love this study that you found for us, Emmanuel. Maybe you can talk a little bit about this one. Yeah, because as as you just said, um, a lot of teens are saying if I would uh, be spending less time on social media, I my psychological health would be better, but the question here is why? Why, why are those platforms affecting that much our uh, mental health? Well, this study, um, this is like a meta analysis. So this study analyzes other study and that links uh, the social media use and depressive symptoms. And the the factor that is the most important in this relation is sleep. It's almost too simple. Like, as human, we have to sleep to have a good mood. You just have to think when you are not sleeping well, you you feel um, you feel more, you know, edgy. You react uh, more promptly. So, why is social media use would um, decrease our our sleep our sleeping time? is because of uh, you know the videos that are always um, running. Even, even if we finish one video, you will have the other one directly after. You don't have to uh, push play anymore. It will continue and you have to discipline yourself to say stop and uh, notification during the, during, uh, the, the night. Uh, if you don't have trouble to sleep and you decide to uh, listen to a episode on Netflix before uh, sleeping, well, maybe you have less and less sleep. So that's something. Secondly, we have online harassment. Uh, online harassment can mean vi being the victim of cyberbullying for some, but it can too mean um, seeing negative comments on Facebook pages, on Instagram pages. If you have a uh, page, you have made, like if you're moderating a, pay a Facebook page, sometimes maybe you face uh, negative comments, hateful comments. Well, for some people seeing this, they will it identify with uh, with like the hateful comments and uh, maybe develop different depressive symptoms. Right. And the two last ones are poor self-esteem and poor body image. I think that this is maybe the factor that we're talking about the most in media uh, relating to uh, being like uh, not well when we are on social media. So it's uh, comparing oneself to this Instagram uh, Instagram life, the fact that we are always just showing our better side on uh, social media and yeah. Yeah, so when, when, they, when they have this, and we've talked about uh, you know, experiencing some form of depression and seeing some of the negative effects. Do do youth recognize that? And then how do they ask for help? Are they going to their parents? Are they going to other friends? Are they going to their, because we're not in schools right now. We're not in our universities. Yeah. We're not in our high schools. Um, we're, so how do, you, how do we find that, uh, that that ask for help is coming? Yeah, w one thing that we observe is that they go to their friends uh, first. They talk with their friends about their difficulties, their struggles, 
uh, that's first. Secondly, they will maybe go depending on the relation, the uh, the relation they have with their parents to their parents uh, to talk about some issues, but they will not. Um, they are saying that they do not point out directly social media. They, they won't say like, I have a problem with Instagram. They will say, I have a problem with this friend um, that keep that keeps like talking to me and sending me these messages. You know, they don't see, uh, they see social media as tools. They won't say, this is the problem in my life. And I was speaking with um, a class about going to resources in their school. And one thing that keeps uh, coming back is this comment that, well, I feel shy talking about my experience with social media with the professional at my schools because I, um, I, I, I fear that uh, I will be judged because there's this like digital life is bad. I, I don't feel really comfortable talking with uh, older people about my experience. So that's, that's why it's so, so important to build that relation, relation of being open-minded and not, uh, not judgmental. Yeah, okay, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Because uh, we've had a couple of questions around that, that line go through. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, so this is happening for, uh, in terms of mental health. We're seeing some negative effects. And we've talked a little bit about this, but maybe we can summarize some of the intervention approaches, uh, or, or you can summarize some of the intervention approaches, Emmanuel. Yeah, and we just talked about that, listening yeah. without So that's the first one. Like, if you're a brand, think about what young people want and need. Don't assume that they need something. Actually talk to them, because we are a lot talking about, um, in the medias, we're seeing things about kids about young people and digital environments but meanwhile we're, we're talking about young people we're not that much talking with them so that's one point talk with them consult yeah and i think brands you know they they like to think that they're engaging with their audience or engaging with with youth but they're talking at them in a lot of ways so they're putting things in front of them that are leading to potential anxiety. So, so you're absolutely correct. It's about understanding this audience and what they're really looking for and creating uh, positive engagements with them, not just throwing things at them. Exactly. Um, and I think that listening to this presentation, it's a great step for that. <laughs> but <laughs> actually talk with younger people too. Um, so the, the second one is to guide. As we uh, said in the presentation as well, it's not new problems, totally new uh, phenomenon that are happening on digital platforms. It's still uh, like uh, the anxiety problem, the, the fact that you are comparing yourself with someone, that you want a nice clothes, that you want this nice, this body that respects the social norms. That So you can address those, um, this, those issues without uh, saying that social media are evil. You know, so address the problem, but not the tool necessarily. And you, you'll see, speaking with uh, young people, I'm sure some people said that they had teenagers at home. They are aware, they are really intelligent when uh, they are speaking about this digital environment. They, they are not blinded by like those Facebook and uh, Instagram ad. They, they understand a lot of this. And um, the last one is, uh, well, be transparent, explain the economic, like your advertisement, um, choose wisely who you are uh, <laughs> advertising with, uh, remind um, if you are in like a nonprofit or something like that, or in intervention, remind about the resources. Um, personally, we're uh, redirecting young people with, uh, you know, like lines that there are people uh, that can help us, like intervention lines. I don't know how we say, but um, and like, yes, finally, there's apps too if you want to. Yeah, David. Yeah, so like help line, help lines or resources that are there. So, so that is, a, as a parent or as someone who's working with you, this is what we can do. You talked a little bit about businesses. Um, mm -hmm. What more, if, if, 
because I, I, I looked at the list and there's a number of people who work with social media on the list attending today. What can an organization or a business do to, to not increase anxiety or depression amongst its followers, but to actually do a good part? How can, how can we as organizations interact with these, these generations and create, a, create social media as a positive place? Any suggestions? Yeah, of course. I would say uh, three things. Okay, the first one is moderating. Uh, your platform, the, the your community. So if you are um, working, if you are moderating a social media community, have clear and transparent, uh, you know, netiquette. We say in French, but like laws and rules that guides your um, you that your page. So we see that harassment and hateful comments can really affect uh, bad mental health. So that's one thing. Have, if you don't have like this uh, etiquette, create one. Two. Par par parlor is gone. So a big part of that's already been fixed. Parlor doesn't exist online anymore. But anyways, go, go on. Wait, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yes. um, secondly, uh, I would say with um, the, 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 the people, if you have like a, a you have like a, this webinar on influencers, if you are working with other people for your brand be sure to be like a model you know when we said that young people are creating their identity they will if they see themselves in your brand in the content that you're showing they most likely to engage with it and when i see uh when i say choose uh wisely the people that i mean young people can uh, identify with is not just like a white skinny girls on beaches on Instagram, even if they have like this uh, big community. No. And the third thing is uh, we talked about sleep. So don't send your newsletter at 2 a.m. Even if you know you will be the only one to <laughs> send it at 2 a.m. Like details like that um, to uh, like do not uh, to not disturb like their uh, their good night's sleep. Because what we find is that their phones are set to make a sound all hours of the night. And yeah. if they're part, if they're subscribing to uh, information from you because they like you as a brand, they're going to get a notification. They're not going to know if it's a text or a, or a message or some new post. And they're going to wake up and they will wake up and they will take time to look at it. I mean, Emmanuel, in your conversations with, with these youth, um, middle of the night, this is a common time to be on social media. And so that doesn't mean that we should be reaching out to them then. We should be respecting the sleep time and recognize time zones. Yeah, and I would I would add like a fourth point is that we, you see that um, one main reason why young people are on social media is to connect. So promote a great social connection uh, a group uh, like a group where people with the same interests can interact um, there's like some brands that are creating group like uh, for if they they are selling uh, for example uh, i don't know like a product for uh babies well they will create this uh, young parent group to uh, create this support a uh, social support kind of community that can like benefit of uh, this network. Yeah, definitely. And, and that, that creating, and a couple of people have commented on this, more comments than questions. That ability to create a community is so strong. Um, but it, to your point of a new parent community, if you're a brand that's part of that community or part of creating that community, you have a responsibility to make sure that uh, you're not increasing anxieties by by having clear rules, as you said, by having clear rules within the order, within the, the community, that's fantastic. One of the, we've seen a common theme of some questions here around um, uh, social class mm. and income, income levels. So is there a big shift in terms of what's creating anxiety uh, by age, by, by social class? Because I know we talk about 
these are generations, but within those generations, there's different segments, different parts of it. So what are you seeing with that aspect of it? Oh yeah, that's that's a really good question. Um, we're seeing on the in schools that if we're going in private schools, uh, we'll mo we'll mostly hear about um, performance anxiety, um, having good grades, uh, being having trouble to focus when studying for exams. You know that this like performance um, dynamic. And when we are in public school, schools is most about um, well, I can pay for that that thing that I'm seeing on social media, and I'm comparing my lifestyle to uh, other people. So th the reality is different. And if we are going into uh, scientific studies, well, the the um, the the people that are more in like. Uh, and I, I don't want to say like lower class or less privileged are the ones that are spending uh, the most uh, screen that are having the most screen time though their screen time is higher yeah so uh, but it, it's yeah so the screen time is higher so the consequences and the back and the bad impacts can be more important too but I like at the same time if people that are having um that are less satisfied with their uh, life and this is in a common sense report that is like a group in the uh, united states it, that study young people and um, the they observed that the one that were having less uh, satisfaction with their life were the one that were seeing that social media was the more important to them because if you feel excluded at school because i don't know you did your you are, uh, I don't know, sick, you have diabetes, you uh, you are gay and don't feel comfortable at school with your uh, sexual orientation, you have those groups of social support on social media. So there's like this dynamic and a lot of differences. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, one of the questions we have is we seem to be stopping short of using the word addiction to talk about social media. Um, are we stopping short? Is this an addiction or is this um, simply a part of, of a life, of this life of these generations? And we have to recognize that it's not an addiction, but there are maybe ways to manage it differently. What's your thoughts on that? Well, the scientific community is trying to uh, understand what could be like a cyber addiction. But I, I would say this, like, are we addicted to electricity? Are, am I addicted to my car? Um, I'm dependent, yes, but am I addicted? Because when we're talking about addiction for the moment, it's really this diagnosed, uh, well, this diagnostic that is important on, uh, that is bad for your relations, you're not eating, you're not sleeping, because of your uh, digital presence. So I would say that we are certainly uh, having like a, a functional dependence because we need this to connect, to, to go to school, uh, to pay uh, your bank account is on your phone. So yes, we're dependent, but in terms of addictions, uh, it's a really hard question, but and um, one thing that we are talking, and we are addressing this with uh, the teens, and one thing that we are suggesting them is, uh, that the experts are saying is to diverse your activity, like to have a diversity of activities, not all with uh, your uh, PlayStation, not all with YouTube. So you can use digital medias, but uh, have some other thing to, <laughs> to do uh, to, yeah, definitely. That, I think that's a good point. And I think that's it for questions that we have. Um, let me just go back to this quickly. Um, what, do, anything else that you want to leave us with, Emmanuel, in terms of uh, you know, the future? Because uh, we're, we're still in lockdown. Um, you know, we're in Ontario here, we're now February 10th, uh, before we're allowed to uh, uh, actually go outside again. No, just before we're allowed to have businesses reopen. 
Quebec is the same. We're seeing this across the country. Yes, vaccines are here, but it's going to be a long time before things change. Um, uh, youth, especially teens are, and university students, are still working for school from home. Yeah. Everyone's still working at home. How, how do we get through the next few months with social media uh, it, to, to help us? And uh, how do, is there any final tips for uh, social media managers on what they can do to help their audiences get through the next few months? Yes, I, the key word for me here is uh, conversation. I like to create this conversation, uh, even if it hurts sometimes to see uh, what is the screen time that you're spending on uh, your phone, to create this conversation, to talk about what opportunities are good for me, connecting with people, and what is difficult. So maybe it's tracing a line between your professional and personal life. Maybe it's cutting all notification. So it's really make a list, like have a conversation with kids. And once you've done that, focus on opportunities and have tools to limit uh, the bad impacts. So download an application, maybe that will cut your social medias when you don't want to use them. Um, you know, so help yourself. Go reach help with technical tools, but you have to have this conversation because yes, we have to adapt our lifestyle, our digital uh, habits to uh, the situation. Okay, one, one last quick question. If there is uh, bullying or blocking going on, and, and I guess this isn't so much for the business aspect, but as a parent or as a concerned friend, if, you know, whatever it is, how do you address this, this when it's happening? You're in the, you're in the heat of it. There is bullying going on. Um, what do you do? I mean, cyber bullying is just another form of bullying. The thing is that it follows you uh, back home. It's not just bullying at school. It's on your phone that is in your pocket all the time so it's to talk with schools uh, to talk with uh, the personnel that is helping and in doing intervention uh, at school uh, it's a really serious uh, like situation and it should be treated the same way either it's uh, online or offline uh, that's the same problem that needs to be addressed like directly and uh, yeah, to create the conversation with the, the person that uh, is doing the cyberbullying and the victim. Uh, it's, the, it's the same thing as before. I mean, it's a serious problem and you have to address it with school. And yes, and take it seriously. And take it seriously. Okay, we have one. I'm going to take the last question here uh, that we received. And I, I think as a, as a parent, I can relate to this, but I think I know the answer you're going to give. So I'm curious to see what you're going to say. Um, how important is for us as parents, is it to properly understand the terminology, the lingo, how, you know, what, what, what is a TikTok, you know, how, to what degree do we need to understand that lingo in order to have these conversations uh, with youth? I mean, if I'm a business, yes, you definitely need to understand the lingo. You need to understand where it's at and you need to be genuine in the way you're delivering it. As parents, do you need to understand the lingo and do a crash course in what social media is uh, in order to talk to you? What's your thoughts? Would, yeah, so I would say that the fear is, is often, often to create like this distance. If you don't know the words, if you don't know the expression, to create a distance with your, chill, your kid because they are using something that you don't understand. So I would say that exchange like you can guide them with the problems the issues on social media but for the small like affordances buttons trends you don't have to you don't you really don't have to understand everything but you can create like this this relation where you ask well what is this can can you show me what you like on this app maybe the the teen will like ah oh, you bug me mom like i don't want to explain to you like what tiktoks i like but they, it's 
It's showing them that you care and that you are interested in, in their games that they are playing a game. What is the goal? Uh, what like what are what do you like about this game? Are you playing with friends? So it's getting there. Like maybe you can learn those those uh little thing by asking directly to your uh to your kid but um yeah the, the most important is really just to to be there and you don't have there's no pressure to understand everything <laughs> just remember when we were when we were 14 we didn't want our parents to understand everything but you need to know that they're there when you will need them yeah yeah and that's about creating that genuine relationship and genuine conversations and that's for parents for brands for everyone that's the key you know know your know your audience if you're a brand and learn about your kids if you're a parent and and have those genuine conversations thank you very much emmanuel for joining us uh thank, thank you everyone you. else for uh sitting in on this uh on this webinar in uh in a week's time we have one on influencers i hope you will join us again you will receive a, uh, an invite uh, to potentially sign up for that. And then we will also have uh, a copy of today's webinar sent out to you, and then the, uh, the actual report. So we touched on some aspects here. You'll learn so much more when that report comes out to you. So I, I hope you enjoy that, and uh, hope everyone is well. Take care. Thank you. Thank you again, Manuel. Bye. Bye.